the Benjamin Mayhew uh, professor in mechanical engineering, uh, Olgi Illich, is going to talk to us about optomechanics, a vision of long range manipulation enabled by sub wavelength metamaterials and meta surfaces. Uh, we are very glad to have Olgi with us not only with mechanical engineer, but with Minri. Uh, the stuff he's doing is very cool and uh, spans many different disciplines. Ogi received his PhD from MIT in physics and he did his postdoc at uh, Caltech in applied physics and uh, material science. So without further ado, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Or Maybe a little bit louder. I don't can know. you hear me now? Um, does this yes. work? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Nikos, for the kind introduction and invitation to speak. And uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in this afternoon. Uh, it really is a pleasure to, um, um, to uh, give a presentation today and engage with the Minri community and tell you a little bit uh, more about the work that we do uh, in our lab. Um, so uh, this presentation, I'll discuss uh, one of the research directions uh, in our group, which deals with developing new ways uh, and tools to contactlessly manipulate uh, objects, mechanically activate them uh, using uh, ways. Uh, and the reason this, um, this research direction is, is very exciting to us is, is twofold. Uh, on one hand, it, uh, and I'll discuss that, enables really interesting and potentially uh, transformative and high impact uh, applications. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, as Nikos mentioned, um, it is a kind of a problem that really necessitates a, a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Um, and as you'll see all the elements from material science, uh, nanoengineering, uh, but also wave physics and dynamics and stability analysis. Uh, and it's not very common that a, a single problem uh, needs um, such disparate um, um, uh, tools to, to, to be tackled. So we find that uh, very exciting. Um, so just to kick us off a little bit about us. So we, uh, we're a new research group started uh, last fall, in mechanical engineering, and we're really a, a group of physicists and engineers um, you know, enthusiastic about understanding how uh, sub-wavelength structures and nanostructured materials interact with light and how we can engineer those interactions for a number of, of applications. And one such application is to really use uh, lights and waves to uh, manipulate uh, uh, objects. And what's really interesting about this, this approach is it's essentially a wave phenomenon. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so what I, what I talk in the first part of my presentation will be primarily related to light, but they're equivalent, they're equivalent physics with sound and something that was a very exciting recent uh, development uh, uh, along, along similar lines and similar uh, very interesting uh, implications. So the time right now is, is, is an opportune moment to discuss uh, using light for mechanical manipulation because recently um, the Nobel Prize in Physics, the, the not last year, the one before, was awarded to Arthur Ashton for his development uh, of uh, optical tweezers. Um, so what those are, see if we think of light as, or photons as, um, uh, particles or wave packets, they carry energy, they carry momentum, and when they scatter off of uh, objects, they impart that momentum and they exert force or pressure. Now, we've known about the concept of radiation pressure for over 100 years, uh, but what Arthur Ashton showed a few decades back was uh, that uh, instead of just thinking of that as a pressure that pushes an object, there are some configuration we can trap uh, objects using light. Uh, and it's really a concept straight out of uh, science fiction. So um, what he showed was that if you, um, um, uh, if you um, tightly focus a beam of light or laser light in a very small spot, you will be able to um, suck up and trap small objects, uh, typically nanoscale and microscale uh, in size. Uh, and then you'd be able to stably manipulate them. And uh, over the last few decades, um, that has uh, really evolved uh, in a number of ways and has seen uh, 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 many different applications. Uh, 
uh, some were in um, cell biology and bioengineering uh, to tether DNA and study its mechanical properties in optofluidics for uh, high throughput uh, sorting of, uh, of particles, in colloidal science, um, suspending uh, aerosols, studying their dynamics, uh, microchemistry, uh, lab on chip reactions, and so on. And it's become ubiquitous to the point where um, simplified versions of these uh, optical traps could uh, be um, acquired as educational kits from companies that supply optical equipment like like Thor Labs. Um, so to tell you a little bit about the mechanics of this manipulation to set the stage for, um, for our research, um, what the way that an object can be stabilized is so we take this very la uh, laser beam of light, we focus it very tightly, and it turns out that the intensity profile of a tightly focused beam gives essentially like a, uh, acts like a spring and it can trap uh, small objects in uh, in or very close to the, the focal point of that laser. Uh, and the key point to remember here is that the stabilizing potential comes from this very tightly focused uh, beam of light. And to give you a, um, a, a, an essence of what that looks like, so um, here's, here's what, um, uh, what the typical configuration might be. So if you look at the left, you see this uh, microscope objective. So it's typically maybe inch, inch and a half in size. So uh, very close to this objective, we can focus light to trap a very small object. Um, and what you see here is actually looks much bigger than it actually is. It looks bigger because it scatters green light. So we can actually see it even when we zoom in. But this is really a, I believe, a nanodiamond is something that is hundreds of nanometers in size. So we typically wouldn't be able to see it with, with naked eyes. So we can trap very small objects and then we can manipulate that. Um, now, as, as interesting as this concept is, it has some fundamental uh, limitations. Um, so uh, one limitation is that the size of the object that you can trap or manipulate uh, is comparable to this uh, width of, of, your, of your focused beam. Um, the second limitation is uh, that that means that the object itself has to be much smaller than the size of the aperture that uh, focuses light. So going back to this figure, we can see if the aperture is maybe, you know, one to two millimeters, you know, object has to be much, much, much smaller than that. And uh, uh, another fundamental limitation is that this um, um, uh, manipulation is possible only in very close proximity to this aperture. Uh, again, going back to this image, we can see that this maybe happens within a millimeter away from, from this aperture. So it's not a long range phenomenon. Now we can think of light, um, especially laser light, um, you know, it, it stays collimated at very long distances. For example, in a laser pointer that, uh, that we know stays, uh, you know, the, 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 it, you can stay collimated, you know, meters, you know, tens of meters, if not, if not uh, further. And um, if we were to trap, try manipulating um, um, uh, with, with collimated but unfocused light, then the size of the object could in principle be comparable to the width of the beam instead of being much smaller. Um, and then the distance at which manipulation can happen, uh, again, can be uh, much, much larger than the aperture. However, a fundamental a problem here is that this kind of dynamics is unstable. So uh, because the light isn't focused, there is no stabilizing potential that comes from the light. And um, what that means is that um, small perturbations away from this equilibrium point would uh, further destabilize this, this object. And recently, um, groups have started um, looking into how can we, um, what kind of um, shape of an object is necessary to try to stabilize something on a collimated uh, beam of light. Um, and um, so here is typically kind of the procedure that you might want to do this um, in. Um, and what I'm showing in blue is, um, you know, there'll be a few equations throughout this talk. Uh, it's not so much important what's in these equations. They're kind of presented as, as more of a, a for, for completeness, but, but the outline in which things, um, things are done. So if you have an object of arbitrary shape or a surface, it has some surface normal that might vary with position. Um, you know, in some beam of light, we can calculate what the forces and torques are as a function of light intensity and 
reflectivity of that object. And once we know that, and we can write out some um, equations for translational and rotational dynamics uh, near the equilibrium, and we can try to characterize the behavior of, of this object. So that is a standard recipe, follows um, essentially classical mechanics with addition of, of, of optics that comes from how light scatters off of, a, of an object of um, a non-standard shape. Um, and then the shape comes from these surface normals that might vary with, with position. Um, so, and now um, what, what, what folks have looked at is, for example, instead of having, um, you know, planar objects, if something is like, uh, like a parabolic mirror, it could be maybe millimeters in size, uh, would have shown that in order for that to be stable in a beam of light, it actually needs to offset its center of mass, um, as shown here uh, uh, to the left. Uh, uh, the cones have been analyzed as well and shown that um, that um, that could actually not be stabilizing um, uh, to, for perturbations um, near the equilibrium. And then some combination of complex beam profiles that have these essentially multimodal um, intensity distributions with um, um, spherical particles could in principle work even for larger objects. But a big challenge is that uh, making objects that are maybe millimeter or larger in size that follow a very specific shape uh, would actually be, be challenging, especially when one needs to uh, then offset the center of mass uh, further. So um, what our approach to this is, is rooted in this um, realization that uh, what really um, is a challenge here is the objects that would be unstable are the ones that have, uh, that essentially uh, reflect light uh, specularly. What that means is that, uh, you know, they would reflect light as if a macroscopic surface would reflect light. And uh, a realization, an idea that if we were to pattern a surface of an object with a, um, uh, a profile that is ordered on the scale that is comparable to the wavelength of light, we might be able to um, realize a configuration where the object would generate its own stabilizing potential instead of relying on that potential uh, uh, coming from uh, the beam of light. So that was um, uh, the idea. Uh, and it's rooted in a recent advance, in recent advances um, in uh, the field of optics and nanophotonics um, that um, we call uh, essentially metasurface optics. So what metasurface optics is, is it a paradigm of mimicking functionality of bulk optical components in a much smaller form factor. So if you look at to the left, this is, for example, a standard lens in, in optics. And the reason that it acts as a lens is because of its shape. So the functionality comes from its shape. So it needs to focus light, and it's curved in a way to do that. Uh, and what instead one can do, and with the last a few years has become a very active uh, field of research in, uh, in photonics, is to essentially mimic this behavior by patterning um, sub-wavelength um, uh, structures uh, on a surface, essentially in a flat form. And the way that we can mimic that functionality by essentially engineering the phase that is imparted to, to the beam. So here you can see that, you know, essentially that's what a lens does. So um, its profile means that different parts would accumulate different phase, and then we would be able to bend light and focus it. And we can actually try to do the same um, in a much thinner uh, form factor. Um, and what we're really doing is we are breaking um, um, this um, conventional um, law of refraction. Conventionally, you might say that the reflected light, a reflected beam, the reflected angle is equal to the incident angle. Um, that's what happens uh, in a mirror, for example, or really any macroscopic surface. If one is to uh, put a, a sub-wavelength pattern, then the reflected angle can be engineered by controlling what phase is being imparted to this incident beam. So uh, where our idea um, came um, uh, recently was um, to take this, uh, and instead of just using this for optical elements and miniaturizing lenses, 
and uh, optical components, which is what uh, is a very active area of research in our field, to realize that in um, changing the momentum of light, we are actually able to control forces um, and pressure that an object would experience. And in doing that, we might be able to realize this self-guiding uh, motion uh, that can happen without focusing uh, a beam of light. Um, so it was a, a publication from last year, and um, we outlined really a recipe that uh, of various kinds of subwave configuration, whether they're these individual resonators or the things that we call matter surfaces or matter gratings, that they would be able to uh, to uh, to realize this uh, this behavior. So in order to to uh, make that argument, we first need to uh, be able to understand how a uh, nanostructured surface um, would impart momentum and what kind of radiation pressure force uh, can be generated. Uh, and an example, for example, you might see a, a diffraction grating. So a standard diffraction grating, what it does, it takes an incident beam of light and it scatters it in different orders. So what one can do is look at uh, the direction that the light is refracted at and calculate the outgoing momentum of light. Once we know the outgoing and the incoming momentum, we can assess the momentum change. And then the change in momentum per unit time tells us what uh, the radiation pressure uh, is uh, on an object that is nanostructured in some way. Um, and um, the way to do that, to essentially get that, uh, that uh, to quantify that information um, can be done through um, what we call, um, what, what is called essentially an surface integral of the stress tensor that corresponds to, um, to waves that are, that are scattered. Um, and um, what happens, uh, again, the, the details are not so important, is that there is the stress tensor quantity that arises from scattering. And then if you were to integrate that around the surface that encloses an object, you would be able to, to get the forces and torques that this object experiences. And the reason I mentioned this here is because further down the talk, there'll be a similar equivalent concept that applies to, um, to sound. So we essentially have this equivalent wave to calculate um, radiation pressure on objects uh, that are uh, of any shape or, or of any size. So once we know how to um, calculate radiation pressure or radiation force, um, we can think of what kind of um, objects uh, would be able to exhibit this uh, self-stabilizing behavior. And our prototyping um, configuration was uh, to um, really our two main takeaway points is that this object would have a unit cell. So unit cell is essentially a, 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 a feature that repeats uh, over the surface or the entire surface of the object. And this unit cell has this asymmetric profile. So it has these, you know, some substrate that'll be made out of silica. And out of silicon, we get essentially these um, a little dis dissimilar elements. And the period of this unit cell is comparable to the wavelength of light. So this is this asymmetric unit cell. And then we arrange this to be symmetric with respect to the center of mass. So as to make sure that at equilibrium, uh, the net uh, force on this object um, would be, uh, the, the lab net lateral force would be zero. So that it would actually be an equilibrium point. So if one takes, if one looks at um, an object like this and we place it in a Gaussian beam, so something that has a peak intensity profile and then, uh, um, then exponentially decays away from the axis of a beam, we can write out equations for um, translation and rotation. For now, we're just going to look at this essentially as a two dimensional problem. So a single translation and a single rotation and what we realize um, is that the translation and the rotation are coupled. So they both depend again on the displacement and the tilt of this structure with respect to the beam axis. So then we can ask the question, how do, can we keep these objects from drifting away from the beam axis? Um, so, you know, linearizing this, linearizing this problem, 
what, what needs to happen is that the forces, the lateral force and the torque need to have the right dependence of displacement and both translational and rotational displacement. And that's essentially exactly what we can engineer these functions as a function of displacement uh, by um, essentially deciding what kind of unit cell we want to fit into this, into this object. Um, and the physical principle, as I mentioned, is that we control how, um, at every point along the surface, we can control how the weight is scattered. And in doing that, we can control essentially uh, in the Jacobian elements of this, uh, of this, of this um, system of, of, of equations. And here is a prototype unit cell that uh, we, uh, we came up with. It, it consists, uh, again, as I mentioned, on a, uh, consists of a silicon um, uh, wafer, silica substrate. Um, this is a uh, 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 micron thick. And then on top of it, there's, um, you know, on the micron scale, again, uh, this very thin silica patterned uh, film of these resonators have sp specific widths. And when we uh, look for what dimensions of these would be, so the wavelength of light is 1.55 microns, corresponds to telecom wavelength. Um, and if this unit cell has a periodicity of about 1.8 microns, uh, we observe the following. So we first observe that um, we have different, uh, essentially, uh, asymmetric scattering between uh, the um, objects that are on the left side and the mirror symmetric objects that are on the right. And what that translates to is uh, this force and torque dependence as a function of uh, the tilt of this object. So specifically, you can see that if this object were to tilt, uh, the torque becomes negative. So it actually um, returns back to its position. Uh, what you can see here, again, is if you do this as a function of displacement, we will see that if it gets displaced in positive x, the force will be negative to bring it back um, in the to the equilibrium point. Um, and so we can do that um, for a specific um, kind of, for, for Gaussian beam. Um, and what then we do, we essentially evolve the differential equations of motion in time uh, to see what the evolved dynamics of an object like this would be. So the video I'm going to play here, the animation is uh, the output of numerically evolving um, uh, the differential equations of, of, of motion. So, so now we assume there's enough intensity that this will be accelerating in this, this z-direction. Um, so that's why you see that this becomes, uh, the, 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 the period of this um, um, wave becomes larger of, of this motion. But in the lateral dimension, it stays pinned to uh, this beam axis. Uh, and this is, again, just a collimated beam. It's not uh, focused the way that uh, a beam in an optical tweezers, a tweezer would be. Um, um, so now we can try to analyze the dynamics around the equilibrium a little bit. Um, so we observe that, for example, if we start displaced uh, 5%, so, if, so D is the diameter of this object, and everything is normalized to the size of the object. So here, if, if we start displaced by, say, 5% away from the beam axis, we observe uh, that the structure stays, stays pinned. Um, and then um, what we, if, if we move, if we, if we make a bigger displacement, this is actually quite large. This is essentially 50% of the beam of the object size is, oh, it's, there's a starting point. Again, it stays pinned, but then if it gets displaced a lot, as you can see here, uh, it kind of makes one pass around the beam axis uh, and gets, gets knocked out. I think what is really interesting to, to realize here uh, is uh, how um, uh, unscaled these, how, how disproportionately scaled these two axes are. So we see that by staying pinned to within, you know, 10% or, you know, tens of uh, percent away from the beam axis, uh, in this um, ladder, in this normal dimension, we could actually move tens, if not hundreds of the of object sizes. So 
the equivalent picture that compares um, these two approaches um, is, is shown here. You know, while optical trap might be able to do this um, in very close proximity to uh, the aperture and have a very small object, here, um, essentially, we could uh, have the same dynamics be uh, tens, if not hundreds of times, uh, the times the size of the object uh, away from, from the aperture. Um, and um, so that was uh, an analysis that was, that was uh, done for this case when you might just have a single rotation, a single translation. Uh, of course, we live in a three-dimensional world, world, so there are going to be three Euler angles and in principle, uh, uh, X and Y and Z uh, degrees of freedom. So then what we, um, what we, um, uh, how this can be uh, um, extrapolated is to look at how these different elements could, could be combined along the surface of the object to give us restoring behavior along all relevant uh, degrees of freedom. Um, essentially the physics is very similar, um, but it just becomes uh, um, a matter of arranging these unit elements uh, in, the right, in the right way. Um, and then, so this is kind of from the concept of, of, of stabilizing, but what's really interesting in kind of the broader box that, that can now be opened is to look at how we can um, structure the surfaces of objects to expand uh, the kinds of modes of manipulation that are possible. So we can think of uh, levitation dynamics uh, that depends on objects, uh, object in lateral, um, um, uh, 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 for lateral motion and for essentially this uh, uh, motion along the beam axis. If the radiation pressure force is strong enough, uh, then we could be propelling and accelerating an object. We could think of designing um, elements that might orient or tilt and steer a uh, nanostructured uh, surface. Uh, but then we can also, with two beams, uh, be in a position to have not just pushing um, optical forces, but actually pulling forces, that we can actually be picking uh, things up using light and do that actually from, uh, from a distance, uh, simply by structuring the surface of, uh, of, of an object. And I think that has some really interesting uh, applications and implications uh, that we are, we are looking to, to uh, explore. So uh, the idea is that going from a standard um, optical tweezers that work at short ranges for microscopic objects and pushing that to macroscopic, what I mean, so maybe millimeters, if not centimeters in size, um, that could be manipulated at large distances, um, has uh, a few different um, um, applications that, that, that could, be, could be enabled. So in the context of science, what one can think of is to use these levitating systems that are, that are larger than nanoparticles uh, for, um, uh, for quantum optomechanics, to essentially study how we can cool um, um, such objects, uh, potentially even to ground state and to enable uh, coherent manipulation to study, um, to study uh, uh, essentially dynamics in a quantum optomechanical system. Uh, one can then think more practically uh, uh, in terms of assembly and fabrication, uh, the ways to uh, to do wafer scale assembly without contact um, in vacuum. So this was, of course, uh, because this is light, this would work in vacuum in a very clean uh, environment, containerless processing, uh, uh, levitation systems for high precision sensing of displacement and force. And then there's also something that is um, potentially extraordinarily interesting, and that is to harness the momentum of light uh, to move objects um, in space. Um, and the reason that is extraordinarily interesting um, is because that could enable paradigms of uh, propulsion that go beyond anything that, that we could do so far. And that the reason for that is because we do not need to carry fuel on board for anything that uses light to, uh, accept, for acceleration. And light, in fact, has been used for acceleration of objects in space. Uh, this is this idea of, of solar sails. Uh, and probably the, the you know some of the, the main example was this uh, Icarus solar sail. Um, so these are large reflecting structures, so meter sized, uh, that essentially uh, reflect sunlight and use that 
to um, that momentum transfer uh, to accelerate uh, and, and, and essentially glide in space. So this was a demonstration by the Japanese Space Agency about a decade ago, like the, the, probably the, the, the first high impact demonstration of the concept. Uh, and more recently, um, there is uh, under active development is NASA's uh, the Near Earth Asteroid Solar Sail. See this very large object and it kind of folds in this very small form factor to be then you know, um, unfurled in space. And this will be deployed uh, next year. So um, um, solar sails are very interesting, uh, but the intensity of sunlight is actually not very high. It's about a kilowatt per, per meter squared. So there's um, not that much uh, force um, in sunlight. But now if you think about uh, the current ways that we accelerate objects in space uh, by using um, essentially rocket-based or propellant-based propulsion, they have uh, the fundamental limitation is that anything that is propellant-based um, is satis has to satisfy uh, what's known as the rocket equation. So that means is that the, the, the velocity that you, that, that you can generate uh, is proportional to the exhaust velocity uh, of, of the rocket or propellant you're burning. And then the logarithm of the initial mass, so the initial mass would be uh, the mass of the payload plus the mass of the fuel, and then the final mass, which is just the mass of the payload. So what you see here uh, is that even if you have a million times more fuel than payload, the natural logarithm of that um, is, is, is actually quite small. And in fact, it's very hard to do better than an order of magnitude um, um, speed gain relative to the exhaust velocity. So now if you think of typical exhaust velocities, again, they'll depend on the, on the propulsion technologies, but it's maybe few to low tens of kilometers per second. And even to be multiplied this by an order of magnitude, um, essentially any kind of um, um, space technology is limited to, uh, to, to speeds of on the order of tens of kilometers per second. Um, and for any kind of deep space exploration, um, uh, this means that it's, it's essentially measured in the order of decades uh, to do anything, uh, anything meaningful. Uh, whereas if one uses uh, radiation pressure uh, from um, a ray of lasers, then um, this rocket equation doesn't apply because um, the fuel does not need to be carried on board uh, and uh, ultra-fast space flight uh, becomes possible. And um, this is, again, kind of a whole separate um, discussion, but uh, I'd like to point out that has uh, garnered uh, quite a lot of attention in the last um, two or three years, uh, in particular driven in part by the breakthrough initiatives that is um, uh, looking to, um, to, um, into ways uh, that such uh, high-speed uh, laser propulsion can be enabled. Uh, and then uh, us, you know, in addition to some other groups have, have, have um, put forward you know, some concept ideas for how this can be, this can be realized. And I, I invite you to um, take a look at some of these, these articles and, and of course get in touch with, with more questions, uh, with any questions along these, these lines. Um, so I think these are some of the very interesting applications uh, in optics, uh, but going back to um, the beginning of my presentation, I, I mentioned this is fundamentally a wave phenomenon. And it actually applies to sound uh, just as it applies uh, to light. And we could uh, uh, do similar, um, um, we could apply similar physics to push beyond limitations that are associated with using sound to manipulate objects. Um, so what, is, what do we mean by acoustic manipulation? So this is um, an example of what something like that might look like. This is what we have, what we build in our lab. This is now what's known in acoustical tweezers. Um, again, uh, what this is, uh, in this particular case, we do not use lasers, we use an array of, of um, uh, transducers, and essentially they can, again, focus down uh, a field and create uh, these nodes, and then we could trap uh, small objects. Now, the scale is completely different, so you can see this is to scale, this is, you can see kind of what human fingers correspond to, um, and these are 40 kilohertz um, uh, sound uh, ultrasound transducers, so the wavelength is about nine millimeters. So we're very much in this macroscopic domain. Um, so the principle of operation here is that we arrange these transducers in, in this uh, configuration to focus uh, sound. And if you could see the intensity profile of sound, you would see something like this. So we essentially create a standing wave. 
with some nodes and anti nodes, and in this node and sort of these pockets of, of, of the zero pressure is where these um, little beads can be trapped. In this particular case, they're polystyrene, uh, sorry, they're styrofoam beads um, that are kind of trapped at these, at these stable points. So this is very interesting. Uh, and so how do we calculate uh, the force on such an object? Um, so uh, the way to do it, so the force will be gradient of a potential. And um, in, in the case of sound, this potential, again, can be calculated assuming some array of uh, transducers. So it kind of comes from uh, you know, somewhat uh, non-trivial expressions. But the key point here is that this kind of trapping, again, only really works for objects that are smaller than, than the wavelength. Um, in this particular case, it would be wavelength of sound. So going back here, you know, these are maybe a millimeter um, styrofoam uh, uh, balls. Uh, so they're, you know, a fraction of the wavelength uh, of, of sound that is, that is used here. Um, so, um, so now we're thinking of, um, um, again, what kind of uh, patterning on the surface, kind of shape, shape of objects could break this limit uh, where uh, only sub-wavelength sized objects could be stably manipulated. And I mentioned this, uh, you know, stress tensor in the context of, of optics. Turns out something similar applies uh, for sound, uh, where we have uh, the, the stress expression and um, we can essentially integrate it uh, around this fictional surface that encloses an object to get what the force uh, would be. Um, and then this uh, applies to different shapes and different sizes. So that's what we thought uh, uh, would be a good approach um, to do something that hasn't really been explored uh, uh, to our knowledge in, um, in, in sound and acoustics um, uh, at all. But first we needed to validate this approach and make sure that it, um, that it, um, um, that it matches uh, what we know and can calculate analytically. So the first step, um, so this is kind of the, the more recent work that is, um, that, um, is done in the context of, um, of, of our MINRI efforts, is to compare this finite element approach to analytical results that apply for spherical objects in plane waves, right? So if I have a spherical object that is uh, in a plane wave, um, you know, there are analytical approaches to calculate that force. So we would compare our, this console, this is essentially finite element approach, so this would be our result with what, uh, what can be done analytically. And we see that um, even for large particles, so um, this particular case, this, um, you know, th th that we can follow these analytical predictions uh, really well. Um, so this was for a spherical object. And then we wanted to do for something that is non-spherical, but still where we can have some intuitive understanding of, of what might be going on. So we took these uh, prism-like objects um, that essentially scatter, um, you know, sound pressure wave uh, in a different direction. So because uh, given angles uh, of, this, of this prism, of this essentially a triangle, uh, we can um, infer mon the momentum change analytically and come up with this theoretical model for what the, the, the lateral force and the, the normal force would be. And when we compare this to our finite element uh, uh, analysis, we actually see a very good match. So that is giving us um, you know, this confidence that we can model um, forces on arbitrary shaped objects that would actually be structured on a sub-wavelength scale for which no analytical approach uh, exists is even possible. So now we are um, um, uh, trying to develop uh, meta surfaces that work for sound. Uh, and again, uh, meta surfaces in the context of acoustics uh, is also an emerging field, but um, primarily in focusing and manipulating sound uh, and not so much or really hasn't been uh, much effort in using this for mechanical uh, manipulation and actuation, which is exactly what, what we are hoping to, uh, to do. So the physics is similar. Uh, you know, we want to essentially generalize refraction of sound to engineer radiation pressure. Uh, we could do this in transmission mode where we essentially can um, change the angle at which the output sound is being scattered or also in reflection mode. Um, and the unit cell um, morphology will be slightly different, but it again shows this kind of periodic, quasi-periodic uh, pattern. So um, 
some of our preliminary results and most of our work has really been um, computational in the last a couple of months uh, because we couldn't access uh, um, our lab. But um, these uh, preliminary computational results are actually quite interesting. Um, so if we, for example, ask how can we um, realize self-restoring behavior, see if one thinks of a source of sound some distance away, and can we, by just translating that source, get an object to essentially follow it? So it may mean if, that if you're offset from the center, that the object would move uh, to again get pinned to sit right below the, the center of this, uh, of this um, uh, sound source. Uh, and this is a, a building block unit cell that we uh, were playing with. And you can see here, this is uh, a range. Um, this is, um, um, it kind of has this uh, arrangement where we vary the depth, uh, this parameter H along the line of this uh, surface. So we essentially um, um, develop a recipe for what would be the value, target value of this depth along the surface. And we could see that um, we could actually uh, get to the situation where the force has this sloped behavior, which means that if something is offset positively, the force will be negative. And if it's offset negatively, the force will be positive to return it back in the equilibrium uh, position. Um, and another thing that we were um, uh, uh, that we were excited to develop is to further optimize uh, these uh, these designs and these structures. So what I mean by that is that, so driven by our understanding of how the waves would scatter, we um, develop these um, profiles. So you can see here an example profile of, uh, of um, so this, was, this can, for example, be done in a thermoplastic. So uh, it actually doesn't matter too much what the material is, um, as long as it's, it's a hard, uh, hard boundary uh, for sound. Um, so this is something that will be guided by, by theory, but then we develop this kind of closed loop uh, of, you know, multivariable optimization approach to start with these relatively ordered structures uh, to uh, non-periodic um, um, uh, um, designs that not only have superior performance, meaning they can maximize uh, the force, but they're also much more robust to disorder or essentially perturbations that might happen during the fabrication process where one might not be able to ideally reproduce uh, the kind of uh, patterns that, uh, that the design calls for. And just to give you a sense of the scale, so you can see here, um, you know, this is for 20 kilohertz um, ultrasound, so that's about uh, 18 millimeter wavelength. Uh, and this period P is about a fraction of that, so maybe, um, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of that. So it's in the order of, um, of maybe between a millimeter, uh, a millimeter or so. Um, so much, certainly much, much, much bigger than anything that ha that's done uh, with optics. Um, and then here's an example of something that is, that is optimized. You can see here, this is scattered light. So this is not um, total field. This is just a scattered field that we can essentially take incident field and we can scatter it um, in, in a very uh, high, at a very high angle, which maximizes these, these lateral forces that we care about. Um, so um, that has uh, kind of opens up um, uh, a box of exciting um, um, things and cool things to do. So we are right now uh, translating these concepts into lab experiments and this candidate designs we've developed uh, into prototypes uh, now that we're back, uh, back in the lab and can actually uh, measure and observe these phenomena. Uh, and then once we can get a sense of, of, of how these behave, we're really interested in to, to, to endow them with more advanced functionality uh, and collaborate with with um, um, uh, um, other faculty in mechanical engineering uh, uh, to, to kind of leverage, in particular, uh, Mike McAlpine's group, their state-of-art 3D printing to essentially add additional functionality that might be optical, might be electronic, might have some sensors in, in, this, in this context. Um, and I think we're really excited about applications. So uh, this essentially allows us to, uh, to extend the, the, the size and the scope of the objects that could be manipulated with sound uh, for containerless transport. Uh, we can think of advanced material assembly, um, contactless imaging, you know, uh, levitating samples to be able to image them from uh, essentially 360 degrees 
uh, robotics applications um, of, of actuation, uh, pulling and picking objects. Again, the same idea of attractive forces would apply when we can use sound to pick something up. Um, uh, in medicine, if we think of uh, something like, like 3D surgery, where uh, one can essentially inspect something from, from all, uh, all directions, uh, and even ideas to generate these, these, uh, these acoustic beds in which we could essentially freeform 3D print. So um, there's a few different ways that this can, um, this can go in, a few different directions this can go in, and we're excited to, uh, to explore uh, where that will take us. Um, and as my last slide, uh, I do want to um, kind of uh, point us to, we, uh, you know, to kind of hope that we can continue this conversation uh, offline. So this is where we are in mechanical engineering, just uh, our lab is, is open up again. Uh, and I want to thank you for your attention and, um, um, uh, you know, for folks who have supported our work and especially uh, Minri. Um, so thank you again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. If anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. I have a comment or a question. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it's very, very interesting. Um, uh, both the, the, the light and the sound applications for this. Um, in terms of robotics, what would you think would be the the first place where you could start, or the, the, the next place where this could be applied? So yeah, thanks. That, uh, it's a great question. So I think this idea of uh, what really excited, so this is where the, the main concept that sits at now is really to try to understand how we can break this fundamental limit of only being able to stably manipulate subwavelength objects in the context of sound. Um, and uh, if we can do this with bigger objects and also have this different dynamics that essentially uh, can pick things and move things in place. Um, so, um, I, I think that is that that is uh, that is of, of rele relevance for uh, uh, for essentially you know if you think of it, it's inspecting objects, right? So if something can be can be positioned in space, we might be able to simultaneously say optically interrogate it uh, from from all different directions, right? Um, uh, if 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 it's specifically a kind of a, a manufacturing or assembly process that needs to be done in an environment. Where you cannot touch uh, objects because uh, you might um, you might damage them. It's something that's very sensitive. It has to be done in a very clean and sterile environment. Using ways to do that uh, would be uh, would have would have appeal because uh, you wouldn't actually have to touch anything uh, to do that. Um, you can think of uh, also doing reactions where you combine things uh, in essentially you know midair without having to sit on a substrate and interact with a substrate of any kind. Um, some things that come to mind. Um, yeah, another thing that's really interesting is, is uh, if, if we can develop uh, the kind of acoustic potentials that can maybe even act as a substrate for a filament that 3D prints something. So instead of that happening on the hard surface, it can happen uh, in, in, in midair. And then we could do this, uh, you know, from from all possible angles. So, so those are kind of some of the potential ways in which this can evolve uh, to um, to do things that might be very hard or impossible right now. Oh yeah, interesting. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, uh, this is Raj. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I don't really know much at all about this subject, but, um, you know, so this, this question might be slightly off from what you presented, but I was wondering if it's possible to use shaped surfaces to create directional sound. So uh, meaning there are many applications where you want to alert somebody with an audio signal 
Um, mm -hmm. But you don't really want to, you know, uh, create a lot of sound for everybody around. You know, you just want to create directional sound uh, and essentially create an audio signal to a particular person, maybe, or a particular car, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just wondering if um, it's possible to create directional audio by uh, using shaped surfaces. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it certainly is. So that is that is one of the reasons why these uh, kind of acoustic matter surfaces are gaining interest is to be able to shape wavefronts, right? Um, and there is, of course, a limitation of kind of you know how coherent um, the, the 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 wave is. So at some point, you know, that can only work up to some distances, right? The advantage of light is that light can be coherent, you know, hundreds of kilometers if not longer, right? So one can actually, you know, steer light with pinpoint accuracy, you know hundreds of miles away. With sound, that's of course much harder to do, um, but it, it still is, you know, essentially by changing the phase, um, one, one steers the wavefront, right? You're still not, you know, doing too much to, you know, obviously there's kind of fundamental, you know, kind of you know, spatial coherence of, of that sound and we're constrained by that, but you could. And again, depends on, on at what distance one wants to do that and also with what efficiency one is willing to tolerate. Um, and ultimately what's, what, what is a big, uh, is also the bandwidth, right? Over what frequencies is this behavior uh, needed? Um, so this kind of waveform steering, both for light and sound, can be done really well for a narrow bandwidth, uh, for a more broad bandwidth if you want to kind of capture a full signal that might have, you know, large span of frequencies, whether they're, whether it's an audio signal or it's a, it's a you know, visual signal, um, then, then there's some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, it, you know, th th there's some issues with, with, with being able to do that for, for a broadband, broadband signal. Uh, so it certainly is possible to, uh, to do for sound. I think it just depends on kind of what the, what the parameters are, 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 how well it would need to happen and over what bandwidth. Okay. Okay. So narrow bandwidth is more possible. And do you think distances of like tens of meters are possible? Ah, uh, it's a good question. I am not, um, Again, it depends what kind of you know uh, spelling out one is one is willing to tolerate, right? Uh, and again, what band, right? So so even for light, uh, it's it's actually very hard, you know. So so this kind of miniaturizing optic components, right? That's a great, uh, you know, if we can do what a you know what a you know say you know millimeter thick lens, that we can do that in one micron thickness, that'd be great. But we actually cannot do that for like the entire visible spectrum really well, right? We can kind of do it for you know one part really well, and then we kind of have some achromatic aberrations for other part. Um, so if you have the, 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 the more narrow band it is, the, 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 the easier it is to do that. Uh, I, we can try to, you know, maybe we can discuss more offline and see what, you know, what kind of frequencies and what, you know, uh, performance metrics might be, might be needed. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, Orgi, thank you very much. Great job. Thank you very much. And uh, 